welcome everyone to the Planet Research Data Commons and the impact of being involved in the Research Data Alliance webinar. Uh, we've got a great series of um, talks here today from uh, projects and partners that have been involved within the Research Data Alliance and also have been uh, involved within the Planet Research Data Commons uh, work. This webinar is part of a series of themed webinars that go and extend all the way through 2023, celebrating the 10th year of Research Data Alliance um, working and operating. Uh, this month, uh, being June, is a focus on agriculture and environment. Um, and there's six, I think five or six other webinars that have hosted worldwide um, this month focused on those, um, those topics. This, uh, this uh, presentation and this webinar here today will be um, live streamed, obviously, but also recorded so um, people can access this and look at it uh, in the future. Um, I'd like to just start, though, this talk by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Nambari people that uh, the land in which I am situated here today. I'm, um, I'm based in Canberra in, in Australia, and the Ngunnawal and Nambari people are the uh, owners and, and acknowledge the owners of the traditional lands in which I kind of speak. I also wish to acknowledge the um, I also wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the of the um, elders past, present, and emerging across the lands and the countries across the world. I want to mention also that we have just completed a national consultation looking at what are the, some of the needs actually of uh, and, uh, researchers within environment and uh, earth sciences. And one of the key data challenge areas that came through and it was loud and consistent was appropriate recognition and appropriate work um, utilizing indigenous data governance and, um, and, um, and knowledge. And so that's a, a loud and consistent finding that we found through the Planet Research Data Commons uh, consultation. Um, Today we've got, as I mentioned, we've got a great, um, a great um, panel of speakers. We have Dr. Andrew Trelaw uh, from the ARDC, Director of Platforms and, Sur um, Platforms and Software for two more days. Uh, we've got Dr. Elizabeth Wenk from uh, Austraits, Dr. Leslie Wyburn, who's the Honorary Professor of Geoinformatics and Geosciences, and Dr. Chris Barlow uh, from the Centre of E-Research and Digital Innovation uh, in uh, talking about agri-fed fair data and tools. These, um, these series of talks really are focused on fair data and some of the outputs and impacts that um, RDA has enabled uh, research within, within Australia. Um, and this is really a celebration of, of the work that has actually happened within Research Data Australia. And as Benny can probably attest, um, myself, I've been a member of Research Data Australia for um, seven or eight years. And actually getting the um, honour to actually present this webinar has been um, uh, really heartfelt and also um, made me also kind of reflect on the work that Research Data Alliance has enabled and the impact that it has actually provided in terms of research infrastructure development and being able to solve those real world challenges. They are solved through the working groups and the interest groups that the Research Data Alliance um, uh, hosts and maintains and provides the culture and the function to enable that to happen. But I actually, whilst that is very, very important and it's actually led to um, outcomes and uh, uh, endorsement and uh, standards being developed, I was reflecting actually that some of the other aspects and the impact of Research Data Alliance is the great networks and the knowledge transfer those international um, structures and how that actually gets translated into research. Me personally, my personal um, work with RDA has led to a great network of um, like-minded colleagues and peers that I'm able to uh, talk with, uh, share ideas and uh, share problems with and get solutions to uh, much more rapidly than if Research Data Alliance wasn't um, in place. And I think that's actually a really good um, summary of some of the impact that actually Research Data Alliance provides. And it's also across multiple domains and multiple disciplines, not just one particular domain discipline, all work towards the same thing. Um, one program of particular that the 
Atlas Living Australia and the AADC have recently released is a national framework for access to restricted access species data. So this is data held on species, which is um, sensitive of nature. So it's either a conservation species, it's endangered, or it's sitting on private or land hold, private land holding data. Through the RDA network, though, we were able to determine what other countries have completed similar type of work where it involves research, government and industry and able to utilise some of their structure and their thinking to be brought back into Australia to make this um, um, project uh, work and also to supercharge how that program was delivered. Uh, and I think that's a really good example of the power of the Research Data Alliance. I also actually really wanted to reflect that the Research Data Alliance has helped us build up our capability, our digital literacy and our understanding. Two weeks ago, the Planet Research Data Commons um, hosted a workshop in Perth where we had 100 participants from uh, research, from government and from industry looking at the topic of trusted data and information supply chains. So thinking through how do we actually manage a supply chain of data and information all the way from collection through curation, integration, analytics to the use cases of state of the environment reporting, uh, environmental impact assessment, research outcomes. And the fact that we are able to have a fruitful and dedicated concept and conversation for two days on a topic called data and information supply chains, I think is a testament to some of the work that Research Data Alliance has done and the general understanding that has been um, developed uh, throughout the community and in areas other than just research, so government and industry. So it's got a lot of wide impact and, um, and uh, work. Um, so the Research Data Alliance, this slide here shows, um, shows it's a global member organization. Any individual can uh, join and register. We have a link there um, to enable that if you're, if you're interested, and I do um, encourage you to uh, flow, um, flow through onto that link. The Research Data Alliance also has had 64 uh, flagship outputs, including eight ICT technical specifications. So that's come from the working groups um, looking at particular issues within research data and the ability to make that fair and, and to share that. Um, and that's led to 64 flagship outputs with 200 plus ad um, adaptation cases across multiple disciplines. Within Australia, we have a vibrant community of uh, participants within Research Data Australia, 785 uh, members across Australasia with 683 in Australia. We have 32 group chairs. So um, 32 people that are actually leading and driving uh, some of those working groups and interest groups and leading that impact back into Australia, but also worldwide. Um, we also have a community development manager here who's actually on the call, uh, Dr. Catherine Barker. And uh, we have two technical advisory um, board members and one council co-chair. We have great representation for Research Data Australia, uh, uh, Research Data Alliance in Australia. Uh, and it is really a worldwide phenomena as well, where we interact with our international colleagues. Uh, both in the sharing and bringing back of that knowledge and information into Australia. So it's 10 years. I, I really kind of look forward to what the uh, next 10 years actually kind of hold. A part of the Research Data Alliance also, um, we are talking here about the Planet Research Data Commons, and this is a new program of activity that the ARDC, the Australian Research Data Commons, is embarking on uh, to integrate uh, data across multiple domains and multiple disciplines within the planet data um, space. If I can just move on, um, Gary, if that's okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, the new Planet Research Data Commons concept builds upon the work that's happened within Research Data Australia and some of the projects that we'll be um, presenting to at, uh, through this webinar. And it's really looking at those research and national priorities and challenges. What we've actually found and what we're actually wanting to achieve is a connected and integrated data system across multiple earth and environmental systems, allowing us to actually address some of the national challenges that are posing across Australia. 
We've seen the pace of change accelerating due to climate change, uh, urban population growth, uh, transition to renewables, and we're seeing that within um, certain areas and use cases of bushfires, floods, adaptation, uh, uh, geohazard events, uh, and, and also new methods of capturing and monitoring and valuing biodiversity and environmental credentials through market-based approaches. The Planet Research Data Commons uh, will be addressing those issues, but also bring in um, research, uh, government and industry to tackle these problems. Uh, we see that uh, the need for integrated dynamic systems to be enabled us to look at cumulative impact over a region and to predict how the environment will change based upon a variety of factors needs fair data, it needs trusted data and information supply chains, it needs networked modelling, analytics and decision support infrastructure, and it needs integrated fair care data sets and services. And that needs to be built upon a backbone of knowledge, understanding and people understanding what those data methods are, how do we actually integrate with um, different disciplines, what those needs are, and how you network these models together. The Planet Research Data Commons is uh, just about to launch, really looking at that knowledge infrastructure. And these are the aspects across multiple spheres that need to come together to answer some of those questions that are faced by a changing climate. The, we'll be um, working on four integrated program activities. So trusted data and information supply chains, What's the accreditation that's needed to actually trust and provide procedural mechanisms of trust between our different data providers um, within different disciplines and different sectors, enabling that data to flow much more freely than has done so in the past, looking at mechanisms such as the international data spaces concepts to make that kind of work at a data level, not just at a system level. We'll be also uh, funding and looking at programs within integrated fair data sets and services knowing that domains and across domains need work to make their data fair and to make that interoperable, but also to look at those standards and the interoperability standards that are required to enable that to happen at scale. We'll be also focusing on modeling analytics and decision support infrastructure. So looking at the areas that uh, take that data, being able to combine it into a, into a, into a coherent stream and making sense and use of that. So providing national infrastructure uh, to support those functions, both within research, government and industry. Uh, and last but not least, as I opened up this uh, conversation, the Indigenous uh, knowledge management and governance is an important factor and providing care implementation across all our research infrastructures is priority of the Planet Research Data Commons. We see these programs operating uh, a, as an integrated fashion, addressing national priorities and challenges, with a regional focus to begin with uh, and increasing interoperability and integration across all our domains. So I just wanted to, um, I will leave that there and I'll say thank you very much. We're going to um, hand over to our next uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Andrew Trelaw. And Andrew is going to be talking about the Globin, not the Globin, the Global Open Research Data Common Interest Group or ORC, I believe. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Hamish, and thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm also delighted to celebrate 10 years of the Research Data Alliance, in particular because I was one of the group of Australians who helped form it uh, over a decade ago, many, many late night video conferences. So it's just wonderful to see the way it's grown and developed. Uh, however, before I, I go through a, a relatively short set of slides, I have to say I feel a little bit like an imposter in that Although I was briefly responsible for the early stages of the Planet Research Data Commons, I do not have a background in anything related to uh, any of the discipline groups. So just take what I'm saying with a grain of salt there. Um, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about a, an instance where Australia is both contributing to and learning from uh, international best practice. Uh, next slide, please, Kerry. So the, the Global Open Research Commons with the attractive name of Gork, uh, we didn't think that one through, I think, uh, is trying to think about what a commons means. 
Uh, and this particular interest group formed before uh, Australia started its research data commons activities. Although, actually, you know, I think even before we had the Australian Research Data Commons. So there are a number of these sorts of initiatives around the world. And what we were trying to do when we first started was say, well, what are the things that, that are uh, pun, pun actually probably intended? What are the things that are common across the different commons? Uh, and we also wanted to see how to network better between what was happening inside the Research Data Alliance and some other international activities run through uh, in particular through CoData, but also through the World Data System. Uh, and so we established this interest group to try and really map out the space. Next slide, please. So we started off at Plenary 14 in Helsinki, um, where we had an initial interest group session after a series of birds of a feather sessions at previous meetings. And we've presented it every plenary since then. And in fact, as part of our work, we've spun off from the interest group, uh, an international model working group, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end. Um, and for those of you that are interested, uh, we have a, a web page that describes our work. Next slide, please. So we tried to uh, early on define what it was that we were going to focus on. And we said, look, what we're really trying to build, or at least what we're trying to build with others, is this notion of a global trusted ecosystem. So this trust idea that Hamish has talked about already, an ecosystem of services and outputs and seamless access. So this is all, you know, very kind of high level and aspirational, but that that was what we were shooting for, drawing together things like the Planet Research Data Commons in Australia with like-minded or similar activities overseas to build towards this global trusted ecosystem. Uh, and the, the strap line, if we ever print bumper stickers, uh, the strap line would be something like digital research resources for the common good. Um, Obviously, we weren't doing this from scratch. When we, we began, we were informed by a number of things that were already underway, work that was being undertaken by the National Institutes of Health in the US, uh, the European Open Science Cloud, that's, that's the best known, uh, some work that had been done by the Canadians on the National Data Services Framework, the World Data System, and so on. Next slide, please. So we tried to pull all of this together. We tried to work out across these existing commons, what are the common elements that you could extract from international best practice? And how could you come up with something that would structure collaborative, activ collaborative activity between these commons? Next slide, please. And so the result of all of this is what we call the essential elements of a research commons or an open research commons. And the idea is that these would guide people who are trying to build, either build commons themselves from scratch uh, or trying to consider how their commons might interoperate between discipline, or sorry, cross discipline boundaries uh, or across geographical boundaries. So in the center of this is uh, the notion of interoperability and standards, that unless you are focusing on interoperability and using standards, trying to build a commons is really going to be extremely difficult. Across the bottom, the bottom three hexagons are the more, I guess, technical elements of the commons. Uh, the compute that you need to process the data, the storage in, in order to store the data, the networks to connect it, the access and authentication infrastructure to enable you to get to it. The research objects, and you'll note that we don't talk about research data, we talk about research objects. There are a range of different things that you can regard as outputs of research. Data are some of those, but so are workflows, uh, so are software, um, obviously so are publications. So for us, these are all research objects that you need to manage in a commons. And then the services and tools that you need in order to produce the, the, the research outputs and work with the, the compute and the storage and the networks. 
And often descriptions of commons stop there. But what we said was, well, no, there's actually this entire overarching, I'm trying to avoid using the word soft. I need to come up with a better word. The non-technical aspects of the commons. So human capacity, you need people with the skills to use the commons, but also the skills to build the commons. You need, and this is an idea that we, we borrowed from the EOS, rules of participation and access. How do you decide who is able to contribute? How do you decide who's able to use the resources of the commons? Um, how do you decide who gets access to the sensitive data that uh, Hamish was talking about? Uh, governance structures to enable you to structure the, the commons and make sure it's going to work. Engagement with the researchers to make sure that they're aware of what the commons provides. And of course, if you want to get people to use your commons, you need to make sure that it's sustainable. Next slide, please. So that's the Global Open Research Commons Interest Group and that diagram and the definitions behind it have just gone through a, a community comment process uh, as part of its um, path towards being a supporting output. Uh, and sorry, can we go back one, please? Uh, and uh, we'll be taking into account the um, the comments uh, and refactoring that. Uh, at the same time, yeah, okay, next slide, please. Um, at the same time, we've also spun up an international model working group, which is essentially looking at the attributes of lots of different commons across the world. And we're trying to abstract from that uh, the common features of things that people are currently building. Next slide, please. And so these two groups are going to inform one another. The, the interest group has tried to do a synthesis task. The working group is doing an analysis task. And those two things, I hope, are informing each other. Next slide. So this is a list of some of the kinds of commons that have been involved so far. Some of those are disciplines. Some of those are nationally based. Um, a reasonable range of diversity. Next slide. Actually, that might actually be the last slide. Uh, so the interest group uh, will be uh, finalising the outputs, uh, that diagram and the definitions, and the working group will be presenting its results at IDW 2023 in October this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and uh, a very topical actually discussion in regards to this talk here today. Uh, and I think I'll join that um, working group after this um, after this session. Uh, please note that if you do actually have any questions for our panelists and our members here today, please uh, put them into the question and answer session, and we'll endeavour to answer them at the end of the presentation today. And this will be made publicly available as well. Uh, Andrew has to leave, but uh, thank you, Andrew, for that uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to move on to now to uh, Elizabeth Fink. Um, she is uh, going to provide a, pro um, um, a presentation on Austraits and vocabularies. Thank you, please. Hi, so I'm Lizzie Wink, the project manager for Austraits. And what I'm going to present on today is the Austraits Plant Dictionary, one of the spin-offs of the Austraits database project. I'm presenting on behalf of the entire Austraits team scattered across Sydney's universities and beyond, and thankful to the ARDC for providing investment. Oh, and it's not moving forward. There we go. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands throughout Australia on which the Austraits data have been collected. I'm speaking today from the lands of the Daramaragal and Darug people and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Now, to, most of my presentation today will be about our trait dictionary, but I want to give a brief overview of the database first. If you think about any organism, this eucalyptus tree here, there are three key pieces of information about it to be documented. It has a name, it occurs in a location, and it has characteristics, traits. For Australia, the resource for the plant taxonomy, the names, is the Australian plant census. Location occurrence data is documented within the ALA, the Atlas of Living Australia, and Austraits 
compiles the trait data. Austraits, the trait database, was first publicly released a little under two years ago with a concurrent release on Zenodo of the database and a data descriptor in scientific data. The database has continued to grow since then, and we now have more than 380 data sets from more than 250 contributors. We're approaching 2 million individual trait um, records within the database with some information for more than 500 traits in nearly every one of Australia's more than 30,000 plant taxa. The graphic in the middle shows that trait coverage is patchy across these traits. For some traits, plant growth form, fruit type, leaf shape, we have nearly complete coverage for the Australian flora, while other traits we might have representation for far under 100 taxa. But overall, Austraits works by merging these individual data sets together. Here I have the data for leaf phosphorus per dry mass. In some, there are, Austraits includes data for over 1,100 taxa, but this exists only because people have contributed these data sets and we have 48 individual data sets, each of which, or most of which have data for fewer than 20 taxa but they have all been merged together and we are very thankful for the contributors across Australia's research community. Moving on, um, the Austrates workflow takes two key components for each of our data sets. There is a data set, there is a data file in CSV format that includes the actual trait data in tabular format and a structured metadata file. These are merged together for all 380 data sets into our single database. It's an open source R workflow, which is available for others to reuse. The metadata file itself is a core component of this. It encapsulates information to align taxonomy, to add location and context information, add methods and information, exclude bad data. And now here merges in our trait dictionary. The trait dictionary includes the following information for each of those 500 traits, a trait concept, so the name and a description, the best practice units, allowable ranges for numeric traits, and allowable values for categorical traits. This information is then also woven together with that data file and the structured metadata file, ensuring that each column in the data file is mapped to the tra correct trait concept, trait data are aligned to the correct units, data that fall outside the allowable range are excluded, and substitutions can be added to match a trait value within the data file to its aligned term within the trait dictionary. When we first started building the Austraits database more than five years ago, we searched around for an adequate trait dictionary somewhere globally that we could repurpose, reuse within Austraits that had those four core components at a minimum. And no such dictionary existed. Nothing had the breadth of coverage. Nothing had definitions that were explicit enough. So it's not just trait concepts, units, values, and ranges that are required. To go a step further, it's semantically clear trait concepts, transparent best practice units, verified allowable ranges, and carefully curated lists of allowable trait values. So what do I mean by this? What is a trait concept? You're probably mostly familiar with the concept, with a taxon concept. A group of organisms that share a common evolutionary history, share morphological characteristics, and have been designated by the taxonomy community to be a single unit and has a name which is widely or you hopefully universally reused. Trait concepts should be the same. They should delimit a collection of trait values pertaining to a distinct characteristic of a specific part of an organism, and researchers worldwide should use the same label. Unfortunately, this doesn't yet exist, which might be part of the reason such a trait dictionary has not existed. Seed mass might include or exclude the mass of a dispersal appendage. Leaf shape might simply um, record the basic width to length dimensions or perhaps also curvature. When somebody talks about vessel diameter, might they be referring to the diameter of a single vessel or should this trait only refer to the average of a larger sample? 
so jumping forward then, we required semantically pure, I'll say also explicit trait concepts, trait definitions, and trait values. And we went about this in three ways for all 500 traits within Oz traits. We held workshops where we brought together experts who used the same trait concept in quite diverse research agendas. We um, tapped experts on the shoulder, asking them to review other traits. And then the Oz traits team partakes in pretty much continuous reviews of our trait definitions. As an example, when we started, here are three traits we had. One asked the parasitism status or documented the parasitism status of a plant. One was the plant's growth form. Is it an herb, shrub, or tree? But actually, we had about 50 terms that had been submitted to us. And stem growth habit, how does a plant explore three dimensions? How do a plant's stems explore three-dimensional space? We weren't very happy with how terms were mapped to these. And, all, and through discussion, we cleaned them up. We went from that brown, muddied plant growth form to five really semantically clear definitions. Plant growth form had included, where does the plant grow? Is it aquatic or an epiphyte? That is now its own trait, its growth substrate, succulents. And there are much tidier, cleaner, shorter lists of allowable plant growth forms. So jumping back to this, this was one part of it. Documenting clearly this information that was required for the Austrates workflow, but there's more to really build a best practice vocabulary. We wanted to link for each of those traits keywords, hierarchical trait groupings. What structure is being measured? Does that trait refer to a leaf, to a flower, or to bark? What characteristic is measured? Are you documenting mass, force, or color? Um, adding references whenever possible. Is there a trait handbook that describes this trait? Is there a paper that champions it? Who has reviewed the trait definition? And then, as the others have talked about, this idea of being interoperable far beyond just supporting Oz traits, make, building a dictionary that helps integrate research worldwide. So we included links for each trait where relevant to other trait databases worldwide. And we have now finished this and just um, two weeks ago have released the Austrates plant dictionary in um, machine readable serializations in three different locations. We have a registered namespace with w3id.org and each of those 500 traits has a unique resolvable identifier that leads firstly back to our GitHub repository um, here is a web page where all 500 traits and their metadata can be explored in a nice human readable format, but also provides links to the machine readable serializations, turtle files, and triples. These files are also now um, in a Zenodo repository and also at Research Vocabularies Australia. So there are multiple portals where they can be explored. So why is this important? Actually, before I go on, I want to jump back and say that this last step would never have occurred without the ARDC's investment. So we're plant ecologists. We could go and write best practice definitions, but without the constant encouragement and help from those at ARDC, especially Rowan Brownlee, we would never have gone the next step to figuring out how to convert our spreadsheets into these machine readable representations. So why is this important? This is the first plant trait vocabulary that ticks all the boxes below. So as I said, every trait um, has a permanent resolvable identifier. The entire vocabulary is machine readable. It is focused on ecological traits. It offers links across trait databases. It includes best practice units and allowable ranges or values for all traits. It includes the vast majority of commonly reported traits. And importantly, it is easy to expand upon. So our, the data itself that is compiled into the RDF serializations is a series of spreadsheets. 
you have to propagate the metadata for a new trait, but beyond that, it is as simple as adding another row to the traits database. But it is also important much beyond that. This is now a trait dictionary that can be reused by others. We are hoping that trait databases worldwide pick this up and use it to underpin other resources. It is also, we also now have a workflow that's out on our GitHub repository that others can use to rebuild additional trait dictionaries. So if somebody wants to build a trait dictionary for a different collection of traits for a different organism, they can use our workflow to go from the spreadsheets that ecologists are familiar and comfortable with into the RDF serializations. So I want to say very much this is a group project. I'm the project manager, but I wouldn't have gotten where I have without our broader team. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz, and uh, great, um, a great outcome there with a, a problem set which is very complex and very varied as well. So um, excellent, um, excellent application of the outcomes of RDA um, into the trait database. Uh, thank you. So next up is uh, Leslie Wyburn, uh, and she'll be talking about Geo 2030. Over to you, Leslie. Okay, just slideshow and here we go. Can everyone see it? Yes, we can. And where's the laser pointer? Right. Okay. So um, this is kind of a project and uh, these are the people participating on it and it's funded by Oscope, NCI, TURN and ARDC and I'd first of all like to acknowledge, oh, geez sorry, the um, traditional owners on whose lands we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. So it's a collaboration through as I said Oscope, TURN, NCI as part of the cross increased national data assets program where we were trying to integrate data sets across all of us but I guess we upped the barrier because we um, said that's why it's called 2030 we want to make national scale high resolution geophysics data sets suitable for programming access in these environments and lay the foundation for more rapid processing for scalable data intensive computation including AI ML etc and the important thing is that the project was about positioning geophysics data collections on an internationally competitive research infrastructure to enable Australian researchers to be internationally competitive. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, but um, this is really what, what the focus of NCRIS is it ensuring researchers have access to cutting edge um, national research infrastructure. Sure. And so what do we know about 2030? We know that it will be at exascale. And the key points is our data volumes will be in zettabytes, which is 10 times more than we've got today. So if you can't handle what you've got today, you better start thinking about what's the future. But what we do know is that it'll be mandatory for it to be fully machine to machine um, accessible as envisaged by the FAIR principles in 2016. So one of the first data sets we went for was this, I'm going to call it Magnetosaurix, which is MT for short, and it measures the conductivity of the crust. And it was a collaborative project between the research community, um, the surveys and some research organisations. And it names to um, measure conductivity at approximately 3,000 sites across Australia. And this is a massive data set because each station where you leave the instruments out for say um, six months or more, um, collects around three gigabytes of data. And the critical factor is the amazing thing is you can use this data for um, groundwater, mineral and energy resource assessments. But at the same time, the same data set is critical for pre predicting Australia's vulnerability to solar storms. If you don't know what that means, um, that's related to the Carrington event where these solar storms can actually wipe out um, all your power stations and your electricity lines, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an increasing awareness given our dependency in the modern world on these infrastructures as to how vulnerable they are. And that's what this data set is about. 
So we start out and we collect our raw data. And this is in gigabytes to terabytes, as I said. And we go through these processing stages through what we call level naught, level one. And then level two, we get to where we're actually getting more accessible. And this is probably called analysis ready data sets and later on our models. Now, please notice above the red line, you're in gigabytes to terabytes. And below that, you're in megabytes. And the important thing is that um, most people don't have the infrastructure to deal with this data and nor do they have the wherewithal. So what you actually see in a lot of decision support systems or online GISs are these highly derivative products and models which are downsampled such that you can actually handle them. And this is starting to become important in the resources industry because what you're dealing with is analysis ready data that's been prepared by someone else to their um, minimum common denominators. But what they're actually arguing is that say seismic imaging, the tools are not universal and you should be able to get at your um, less processed forms of the data and use it to fine tune to whatever your particular use case is. Now, we started to bring this data as part of an earlier project onto NCI. And you can see how we've got these massive data sets. And notice how once we put them onto HPC and parallelize them, how we were able to actually do the processing in a matter of minutes. So whereas before you just had a few groups putting out these massive data products, now researchers, if you give them the infrastructure, can get at that data and reprocess it to their actual use cases. And that to me is about more targeted innovative research than having to take products generated by others. So where is the OSLAMP time series data? We thought, well, we better try and get this stuff now we've got the infrastructure and put it on. And this is kind of what we found. And we went on this massive um, rescue effort to try and find the data. This is the time series data. Now let me know, uh, show you the products were available, but this raw forms of data were not. So I actually went to um, so we use RDA, the data rescue group and this paper here getting access to um, historical data is very difficult. Oops, sorry. And um, in this paper, it actually says, track down the author and ask nicely, which is what we had to do. Um, the other important thing though, is when you start to generate your data and you can do it so easily, you can actually see the number of products starts to proliferate. It's really hard to know which data set that is available online can actually be trusted and used and which one goes back to the rigid edge versions. So there we enter the RDA data versioning group and I've got a conflict of interest because I'm a co-chair of it. But we then took their way that they use this further functional requirements for bibliographic records. It's an old library thing and um, where you look at the work and from the work you create an expression you manifest that product in multiple formats and you make it available on multiple sites. So there's another one of our 2030 data sets, the ASTA data set. And you can see how level not level one, blah, blah, blah. So here are, if you like, all the um, kind of products, but they're available as BSQ, GeoTIFF or NetCDF. This is very important for um, geophysics at HPC because we need to get the data in self-describing modern formats. And then you've got the multitude of products. But by preparing this map through what the data versioning principles were, we could start to differentiate and map out all the products and pick those ones that we wanted. The next thing we found is geophysics is, tends to be siloed with each community working amongst itself to measure these variables. And so once we started to get the data together, then on HPC, you could see how people could do joint inversions um, between say gravity and magnetotellurics. And we know that in the not too distant future, people will be doing multi-physics analyses. And this is another product we started to look into, which is the IADOP, the interoperable framework for observable property terminology. 
And it has a strong focus on variables in environmental research, which encodes what is measured, observed, or derived. And so, as I said, geophysics data is rather systematic, regardless of whether it's gravity, mag, MT, et cetera. It's based around this survey station run concept. And from this ontology that was developed, you can see how we can start to put those all together around variable sets, variables, properties, et cetera. Now, unfortunately, the money's run out before we can do that. But were we to be able to do something in HPC, machine readability, I think the interoperability of the data between all those different geophysical data types, um, this will be a critical approach to adopt. The thing we found is that um, not many are doing this data intensive work in HPC environments, but I was thrilled in June 2022 when we saw that this BOF led by Timaya Biro from the um, Finnish Supercomputer Centre and Christine Kirkpatrick from the San Diego Supercomputer Centre um, came to say, well, hang on, when you go to supercomputing centre, nobody deals with data. And so they came to RDA, but um, the problem is there's not many people in RDA who deal with HPC. Now, unfortunately, they're going back to HPC conferences, but um, it's just sort of showing there's a bit of a gap in this thinking and modern competitive research data infrastructures. Another group that's worthy, um, again, conflict of interest because I'm a chair of it, but we have this group and the focus of this Earth Environmental Sciences group is just to get people together to talk about what data infrastructures, what vocabularies they're developing, and hopefully we'll be starting a, re a repository catalogue soon. So uh, again, join us if you want to. It's just we meet every plenary and start to try and reach out to new projects and highlight what they're doing. So now just to finish on geophysics, um, Australia is well endowed with geophysical data, but the problem is it's all that um, data products that are available. And so I guess the conclusion of our project is we need to make up our minds today if we want a competitive earth science HPC infrastructure, because if we do, we need to start now to find these raw forms of critical data sets and their collectors above all, and ensure they are fair and machine actionable, make these more accessible to build these natural um, seamless high resolution data sets, which is something that is in the national roadmap for research infrastructure. Um, RDA is a good place to find some of the components you need, but I'll just have a dig, HPC data issues are missing. And finally, I'd like to thank ARDC, NCI and OSCOPE for funding this project, which ends in two days time. Thank you. Hey, Mitch, you're muted. Thank you, Kerry. Um, thank you, Leslie. Um, <clears throat> that was an excellent presentation, bringing in geophysics, HPC, and um, you know the future of data needs to be absolutely machine to machine and fair. And how RDA has helped in that kind of process. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least is um, uh, Chris uh, providing a presentation on AgriFed Fair Data Tool. Thank you, Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. I'll just share my screen, make sure that works. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, I can. Yes, okay. that's good. That's Thank good. you. All right, okay. Um, so my name is Chris Barlow. I'm from the um, I'm from the Centre for E-Research and Digital Innovation in here and here in uh, not sunny Ballarat. Um, so I was tasked with the um, uh, with um, creating a, um, a fair assessment tool for the AgriFed project. So this is about this. Um, okay, so just a little bit of background on it. Um, so where, where this came from is um, AgriFed started with creating a data policy which sets the acceptable levels of fairness uh, for data sharing throughout AgriFed. Uh, based on that was the AgriFed technical and information policy suite, which actually describes a set of um, 14 specific um, fair questions with corresponding minimum ideal and stretch goal requirements. 
based on that, um, some of the AgriFood members uh, created a spreadsheet, uh, which was initially used for data stewards in the early stages of um, AgriFood project. And it specifies uh, the minimum fare thresholds and the types of evidence that are needed to actually support um, what what the whether these standards were met or not. And then the, uh, based on all this, um, I wrote the AgriFood Fair Assessment Tool, which is a public web-based application. So, okay, so the reason we didn't use existing FAIR tools is um, there's, a, there's several. Um, firstly, during interviews and data assessments that were done in the early stages of AgriFed, it was shown that in agriculture, many data sets rated very low in for fairness, especially for uh, findability. Like there was a lot of data that wasn't even on a website, it was still on like thumb drives and stuff, uh, or there was hardly any metadata. Um, AgriFed, um, therefore needs a very strong emphasis on supporting users throughout their fair journey because we're starting in that from that sort of very low, low point although no, that wasn't a cross all but that was a common occurrence okay and then we looked at existing fair tools to see if we could reuse any of those um, now the first problem was that all the fair tools that um, we came across or that we could find um, use my numeric scores and that doesn't really work with AgriFed's minimum thresholds um, secondly um, of the fully automated tools um, which there are only a couple. Um, they're really good, um, but they, they don't work unless you have um, certain minimum standards, like you need to at least have a URL or machine readable metadata, otherwise they just don't show you anything. Um, most of the tools um, have a fairly limited in-application help, which sort of didn't gel with the idea that um, users need to be supported through that. Um, some tools don't allow a saving of assessment results. Um, None of them allow um, a reassessment of data sets. I say you assess your data set, do initial assessment, and then find that you need uh, need some work to to get to um, minimum standards. Um, then you go and do the work, and you want to reassess it. You can't do that unless you actually go and uh, re-enter all the data. So um, that was a limitation. And then the other thing is none of the ones we found were actually domain specific, which we felt was important. So what is the FAIR assessment tool? Um, it's a full stack PHP application, which was uh, written using the Laravel framework. It's got a Postgres database um, and it, on the front end, it uses our JavaScript with a view framework, which, which was really helpful to create the sort of complex um, questions, answers and, and handle all the data client side. Um, so the FAIR assessment questions, all the selectable answers, the scores, and all ancillary information like um, help and um, like in pop-ups and all sorts of stuff uh, are loaded dynamically from, from a database and they're loaded as a uh, JSON object. Um, the reason we did that was because then uh, it is possible down the track to have like multiple different versions of FAIR assessment. Let's say if, if, if the standards um, are updated, which the literature suggests might happen, we could run tests for um, other digital resources. I mean, currently it's set up to handle data sets mainly. Other questions are specific to data sets, but with a like version system, you could have a version for say um, software or um, vocabs or services or something. So other digital resources. Um, and of course it would also make it possible that we can um, use an entirely different set of questions, which then just display in the same form using the same infrastructure. Um, all user responses and submitted fair assessments are saved in the database. So that means people can go refer back to it. Um, it can be used to print out, it can be, uh, well, and then within AgriFed, we're actually um, requiring people to sign up so that we can create, uh, sorry, that we can collect usage metrics. Um, and this data collection had to be approved through the um, ethics committee. We already had an existing ethics um, uh, approval in place for, uh, the interviews that were conducted in the early stages, but we then extended that to also um, allow collection of information from the, from the tool. Uh, actually, what I'll do is I'll just open the tool itself. Okay, so um, the FAIR assessment tool itself um, presents its uh, well, it's available online at assessment.agrofed.org.au. Um, it does come up with a, just a, um, a screen that sort of explains roughly what it is with a link to the um, um, ethics approval and everything. Uh, people have to, if they're not registered, they have to register, otherwise they log in. So I'll just log in. And then the same screen appears again, but you can now enter a new assessment or view assessments that you've already done. There's also a link to AgriFed webpage, help page, 
Um, anyway, we'll look, we'll look at this. So if I want to run a new assessment, it opens the um, assessment form um, where you have to enter the name of the digital resource that can be the name of the data set or some other meaningful name, uh, a description if you wish, and the reasons for assessment. That would be probably whether it's an initial assessment or whether you're doing a reassessment or follow up or something. Uh, we put in um, a lot of in a lot of like pop up help here. Now I have to say thank you to ARDC because <laughs> we took a lot of the resources from the ARDC webpage and embedded it in there. So we have um, help for all the main um, headings. So obviously findable, accessible, etc. Um, and each question, each of the 14 fair questions also have um, a link for help with uh, external links and explanations about what is um, what the question relates to. So each question has a number of possible answers um, to be selected from. And what happens here is if we select one, it will then say, well, can you please provide evidence for this? And then this is in this field, you might, you would put in a URL. Um, you can indicate a status, whether like in the early stages, you might say, okay, we haven't even thought about it, or we, we're considering we, it's already being implemented, or yeah, it's already fully implemented. And you can enter notes. Uh, let's say if I select one that is actually like the minimum standard of AgriFed, then immediately um, with this, the, we get visual feedback about the meeting the standard. Uh, so you get this sort of green bar saying that you've met the acceptable standard. Um, also, as I've gone to different um, selection here, it's asking me then, then the, the evidence that I supply is updated, not the request for the evidence updated. Um, and then for every question, there's different uh, selection of answers. Um, and it is indicated then whether uh, the AgriFed minimum standard has, has been met or not. Okay, so instead of just <laughs> filling the entire form, which takes way too long, uh, we'll go and look at an assessment that we've already run. Now, uh, when the when we've done an assessment, but we hadn't finished it, the user can leave at any time and come back. So, so the, all the all the entries in the form are automatically updated. So then you come back to the assessment. And in the assessment result, you can see where the acceptable uh, where the acceptable standard has been met, uh, what the evidence supplied was, what the status was that you entered, and it may you may also enter assessment notes. Um, so this one wasn't finished, so that's why a lot of it isn't filled in yet. So that's the bottom part, and in the top part, we've also added in uh, supporting scores. While we say we this is this is specific about the um, acceptable levels. We also added in scores just to make sure that if people are going through, um, starting off with a data set that's on a memory stick and then they go and put it on some on uh, in a, in an internal catalog with a number, that's an improvement on not having it indexed at all. If they then put it on a um, on a behind a URL and you can actually find it on the internet, that's an improvement. And even though that doesn't yet meet the minimum acceptable standard under AgriFed, it will show a little bit of a score so that when people then go and um, improve on the previous one, they see it's an improvement. Um, it's just to, to encourage them to keep going. That's that's kind of the main reason for that. Um, there is a hover here that explains what these, what these bars mean. Um, and then we have supplementary Fuji assessment course. Um, the Fuji assessment tool is a, is a fully automated API um, that um, measures uh, the degree of machine readability. So while the metrics are a bit different to the metrics that we use within AgriFed and they don't reflect the, our, our acceptable thresholds, uh, it is still a useful indication of whether um, a data set actually has machine readable metadata. Uh, help about that is in this little pop-up. Um, so that's automatically done in the background. Of course, if you don't have a URL for data set, nothing will go in there. So um, that's that. While a data set hasn't been submitted, so you, you say maybe entered, uh, answered some questions and you had to go away and come back, um, find out more information, come back and fill in the rest of the form and the assessment is open, you can go back and edit the assessment, which means then you go back to the assessment form, everything you entered so far is there. And you can just continue on until uh, you've entered everything, and then uh, it is you can submit it. 
uh, I'll just go back to this, show another example. Uh, once it's been submitted, it shows in the list uh, like so. Um, you can go back in and view the assessment. Um, here's one that had a, that basically complied with everything. There's different levels. There's um, the ideal level or just a barely acceptable level, but we are fully compliant. So this one would be compliant under AgriFed uh, and it wouldn't need any reassessment. But let's say if we had um, assessed the data set uh, and we find that it hasn't complied with AgriFed, uh, we might then decide, okay, we're going to go and uh, undertake some significant work. We will, we will um, into DOI, we'll upgrade the metadata, do all that, and then we can reassess this same resource and we'll open the uh, assessment again but you can you can uh, change all the all the um, um, you can change where you've improved it and it will show as a second assessment here as a separate tab and each one and and there will be stacked bar graphs so there's one for each assessment and subsequent reassessment until you get to the point where everything is uh, hopefully in green and um, Yes, well, that's basically it. Um, that's all I wanted to show. Um, the fair assessment tool is available online at this address. Um, source code um, is available on, uh, it's open source, it's on uh, GitHub. Um, I've minted a DOI for it with a bit of extra information. Uh, link to the AgriFed website. Uh, if you want to try it out and you find anything, you find bugs or you have suggestions, please contact me. Um, and then I'd like to acknowledge that. Um, um, ARDC um, made investment into this. Um, I acknowledge the developers of Fuji Fair tool and uh, thank you to uh, Richard and Scott for helping me with the source code and, and the deployment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. And um, thank you also to all our speakers today in helping us celebrate the 10th anniversary of Research Data Alliance. Um, fantastic presentations looking at uh, fair data, the implementation, you know, tools to actually assess that, as well as some of the practical applications that can be uh, derived from this work. Um, at this note, we will um, we will uh, end this uh, end this webinar. I wish to thank all our uh, participants for joining. We will be making this uh, webinar and recording available on the ARDC website as well as the Research Data Alliance website. And uh, that will have links also to our um, speakers if you wish to follow up more and that has sparked some interest. I encourage you to go and have a look at the Research Data Alliance uh, website and uh, register for any of those working groups and interest groups as well. Uh, thank you also to Catherine uh, Barker and Kerry Levitt for helping organize uh, today's event. And I wish you a very happy Wednesday afternoon. So thank you very much and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>